He's the former president and publisher of the Sun Herald, and now he's on the radio. Welcome to Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome to Coast View. I hope you're having a great day. This is the show that celebrates the men and women who are making coastal Mississippi a better place to live, work, and play. In the first segment today, we have uh, Mayor Mike Smith, who's the mayor of Waveland, and we're going to talk about a number of different issues. I look forward to getting to know him better. And in the second segment, we're going to be talking with Jeff Duncan from The Athletic, and we're going to talk about the Saints and what the latest is, and uh, are we going to have an NFL season? Jeff's got the latest. I look forward to that conversation. So now let's bring uh, Mayor Smith into the conversation. Mike, how are you doing, buddy? I'm fine, my friend. How are you doing today? It's, yes, it's, I'm doing f fantastic. It's great to see you. You know, when I think of Waveland, I think of Ground Zero. I gave speeches all over the country after Hurricane Katrina, and I showed the the Sun Herald pictures of, of the Katrina damage and what happened. But, but I, you know, I think over and over again, people were surprised to hear that. Mississippi was ultimately ground zero for the storm. And if there was a ground zero in, in Mississippi, it was definitely Waveland. So Waveland has seen its share of challenges. So here we are this year. You've got the pandemic you're dealing with. You've uh, you've had to deal with uh, Cristobal. We'll talk about that coming up here in just a second. But, uh, you know, you're a, fire, a, a, a former chief of, of, of the fire department, so you're not uh, a stranger to challenges. And uh, I guess it's just normal for you to just face them and and move forward is that about right for you well you know yeah that's a that's a gr uh, great way to depict it because for the 28 years i was in the in the fire service it was snap decisions i mean you didn't have you know time to put a lot of thinking or thought process into it and so i guess that helped me as well as the previous mayor was my fire chief when when i was hired on at the fire department well now it's 33 years ago so it was it's kind of interesting. I was laying in this morning just thinking that, um, you know, the, the previous fire chief started out as a part-time firefighter, worked his way up through chief, retired, uh, run for mayor, won. Um, and then, of course, he hired me part-time. I worked my way up through the chief and retired as well. So um, kind of interesting that I followed exactly his footsteps. You know, yeah, you know what? What, what's amazing to me, though, is that uh, we've learned over the years that buildings don't make a community that people do. And you think about the challenges that Waveland had after Katrina, especially after Katrina. And you know so many people who could have just <laughs> cashed in and left. And they didn't because there's this incredible connection to that community. There's something about the heart and soul of Waveland people, isn't there? Yes, sir. And that's what draws that's what draws me to um, continue doing what I'm doing is, you know, working for the cities because the people is, is really unique people, uh, unlike any other city along the coast. Uh, and I guess being the westernmost city on the coast, um, you know, having, you know, direct ties to New Orleans, direct ties to the rest of the coast just makes a, a unique flavor here. Yeah, I was interested and in kind of refreshed my memory a little bit. At one point, the Daily Herald, back many, 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 many years ago, actually referred to Waveland as a former part of New Orleans. <laughs> there were, right. The people of New Orleans literally saw Waveland as an extension of that city and believed that it was actually part of the city at one point. But that's uh, that's just part of the history, isn't it? It is. And, and you know, uh, it's interesting that you're talking about that. Uh, and then we're having this conversation about New Orleans because yesterday I had the request to rename Coleman Avenue Little Bourbon, uh, <laughs> you know, for future development. But yeah, uh, because the city of New Orleans downtown is not, you know, doing that great with the COVID-19 stuff. And so um, and, and there's what we can talk about the development, but kind of what causes that question to be asked about the name. Well, we can do it now because I love the fact that this is just a conversation, but it is, it's exciting seeing the, the vision for Coleman Avenue. And people should understand, and you'll talk about this, that some of the, um, you know, it, whereas in Bay St. Louis, O-Town and, and, the, and the shoreline there next to the harbor is high. In the case of Waveland, you guys don't have that benefit. So you, you have, to, have to build up and you've got this great and creative concept around the boardwalk. So why don't you walk us through that a little bit? Okay, the, um, yeah, exactly. With the issue with the FEMA flood maps and the elevation restrictions that we're under, 
um, you know, that compared to the actual ground elevation of Coleman and the beach, uh, you would have to be 23 feet above ground, above ground. And so the ridge where Main Street comes out to uh, the Bay Road and, and Bay St. Louis is the highest ridge between here and Florida. I mean, so that's amazing itself. Um, but our, um, the only way that Waveland's going to come back on our downtown side is either the boardwalk or a similar concept because you, to get a business to come in and, and build 23 feet above ground is just cost prohibitive. So the plan is with the boardwalk is that the city would build the boardwalk and build the building on the boardwalk, a 360-foot long building, maybe 60 feet wide, and then you go in and you build out what you need for whatever business that you need uh, and that you would purchase that based on how many employees, how much potential sales tax back to the state, that sort of thing. So when we pitched the concept to MDA, they loved it um, and actually offered a little bit of money to, to go toward it. Um, but, you know, that um, combined with the marina, which Wayland's the only coastal city with no marina, never had any, um, no beachfront uh, development, you know, as far as business-wise, was ever on the beach that I know of. Um, but so this would be a first in those two aspects. Um, but it's real exciting. And where that concept came from was just an idea. Uh, and we went to Destin, Florida, looked at their harbor walk. I don't know if you've ever been down there. Oh, that's, yes. yes. That's where the concept came from. Well, it's, it's really, I mean, you think about it. I mean, when, you, when you're planning for a, a city, and you guys have had the chance to kind of rethink some of this. First of all, Waveland along the beach is very residential. It's always been seen as residential. But Coleman Avenue comes into Beach Boulevard, and that's, of course, that's where the public pier is located. The, 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 the vision of this sort of this downtown center connected by boardwalks. And I, I love the fact that the, you're, you're, it's a different kind of a pitch because you're saying we're not, we're not trying to make this a – a development where we're going to get a big return on our investment. What we're trying to do essentially is break even with this development. And but what the jobs and the people and the opportunity and the restaurants and the opportunity to create sort of this walkable downtown space that attracts people sort of like Bay St. Louis doing now with their with their uh, old town and their their uh, Beach Boulevard effort. It really has a lot of a lot of potential muscle, doesn't it? Well, you know, the and going back to when we put the, we built the lighthouse uh, a couple of years ago, uh, of course, you know, one point nine million dollars sounds like a lot, a lot of money, but just the foundation alone was a million dollars. And so, speaking of that, I mean, that surprisingly to me brings in that boardwalk brings in a lot of people, a lot of family to that area. And so, when I see that, it just it lifts, you know, it lifts you up. And so, gives you more, gives me more effort to put into the boardwalk. I just want to push it. Um, mm -hmm. So. I put it out on every media uh, outlet that I had, inviting developers in and, and investors in. And so there was a lot of great comments. I, I didn't have any negative comments about it, uh, which is, which is you know, amazing to me. But um, a lot of um, investors and developers, I say a lot, more than 10 is a lot to me. Um, but a lot have reached out to me, and, and they want to be a part of it. Um, there's businesses that want to be on that boardwalk today. Um, there's a rec the restaurateur that, that I spoke to um, two weeks ago that is right now planning something on the, in, in that area. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. I got another call yesterday from a, another potential uh, developer. So when you hear that, now when you come up Coleman Avenue and you get to the business center, you, you can almost build right on the ground at the business center. And so at City Hall and north of City Hall, you can build essentially on the ground. Um, no really elevation restrictions that you have here. So there's a lot of different ideas that, that are float, uh, floating about that really ex this excites me. Well, I've, you know, I learned after Katrina, there's so many incredible examples um, when, 
when you have a when when you have a will, there's a way. You find a way, and all you have to be is doggedly determined to see that vision come a reality. You know, you've been smart with Thailand's funds. You know, there's BP money that's going to be available. I would r really encourage you to go after that because the kind of investments that they're looking for and with the BP money are ones that will pay dividends that that will create jobs and create an opportunity. Um, it's there. You know, the bottom line is you just got to build safely. You got to have to do. Do it in a way that that creates, or at least lessens, the damage that's going to occur. So that there is some sustainability after the typical, after the typical hurricane. We we can't build for Katrina. I mean, that's, there's no way. But we certainly can build for you know the typical. For for example, Cristobal. I mean, I mean the the storm surge in your area is that in the eight foot range. Is that about right? That that was a that was a lot. I live on the water in, in Biloxi, and I, my guess is, is it was about five and a half feet here. But man, the water that small, or actually large tropical storm was pushing was pretty dynamic, wasn't it? Well, it's it, you know, and it was crystal ball was unique in the way that it was just so big, like you said. Um, and not real organized. And so the direction that it approached the, our coastline, we were in the in the perfect area to get the most water. Uh, just like in Katrina, that was the perfect storm for us. That was the, the thing that we always planned for. Mayor Smith, why don't we do this? This is Mayor Mike Smith from the city of Waveland. We'll come back after this break and we'll continue this conversation. But, you know, Nash Roberts always said when storms hit that mouth of the Mississippi River, it kind of makes them jog to the right. We've seen it over and over again. Now, somebody says Crystal Ball wasn't big enough to do that, but it certainly still did it. <laughs> and it put you guys right there in the, in the, in the bullseye. But we'll be back after this break and, con and continue our conversation with Mike Smith. Everyone knows the only thing better than pizza is free pizza. And right now, buy a $10 gift certificate to CeCe's Pizza for only $5. It's like buying a pizza and getting a pizza for free. Go to our station's website or Facebook. Look for the Half Off Deals logo to purchase this amazing deal right now. What decisions are being made by state lawmakers? And how will they affect you, your family, and community? If you listen, if you listen, you'll know. Super Talk Mississippi, the Super Talk app, and at supertalk.fl. Hi, I'm Billy Kinder, host of Big Billy Kinder Outdoors. Hear the show Saturdays at 1, right here on Super Talk Mississippi. Turkeys, whitetail, Grenada Lake crappie, or Gulfport redfish. We enjoy it all, especially when you're in camp with us on Super Talk Mississippi. From the Gallo Archives. In the House, first time since 2014 Senate race, Chris McDaniel. Looking back on the election 2014, if Chris McDaniel had not so vehemently rejected the result after the election and marched on, you would today be a viable candidate, either for lieutenant governor or for governor. I thought what occurred there was beyond the pale. They called me a Klansman. They called me a racist. They called me the most despicable things in the world. And we know good and well there were crossover votes that occurred and the evidence was strong. Did you ever talk to Fab Conklin after that? I tried on several occasions. Oh, is that right? You know, he, he never did return my call. And I always wanted him to know that I respected him as an individual. And, and but the disagreements didn't change that respect that I had for him. Are you looking forward to the next session? Uh, yes, sir, very much so. I, it's the first time in some time I, I'm not going to be in timeout. The powers that be have a way of punishing if you step out of line, so to speak. You know that. I know that because George Flags <laughs> taught me that. <laughs> right, so. From the Gallo Archives. This is House Call for Health. Medical researchers spend years developing drugs to treat cancer, but it's possible the next big cancer-fighting breakthrough could already be in your medicine cabinet. Scientists have long known that a drug for one ailment can sometimes be effective in treating something else. Aspirin is the most famous example. Researchers at Harvard, MIT, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute tested more than 4,500 existing medications. They found 48 drugs that killed at least some cancer cells. These drugs Drugs are for several different conditions, including diabetes, inflammation, and alcoholism. One drug is used for treating arthritis in dogs. Researchers in the journal Nature Cancer said the medications sometimes worked in different ways than mainstream cancer drugs. Now they hope these drugs can be further developed into true new weapons against cancer. For more health news, go to foxnewshealth.com. House Call for Health. I'm Lisa Brady, Fox News. Be sure to go by this station's website and check out the half-off deals Audubon Zoo tickets for just $15. That's half price, $30 zoo tickets for just $15. Again, go to this station's website or Facebook. Look for the half-off deals logo to purchase yours now. 
talking to the people that help make the coast such a unique place to live. This is Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. We have Mayor Mike Smith from the city of Waveland with us now. And uh, coming up in the second half of the show, we have Jeff Duncan, the uh, esteemed Saints columnist and reporter. He's going to give us the latest on the NFL season and what's latest with the Saints as well. So, hey, when we went to break, we were talking about Cristobal and the uh, eight-foot storm surge that you guys got. Uh, what's the bottom line on the storm now that you look back on it? Well, all right, so if I can, I want to throw back just a little bit to the 100-year flood protection levy in New Orleans and the, um, the land bridge. And so when that was, was being in a process of being built, uh, the previous mayor and I went to those meetings, and, and we were the only ones from Mississippi that were there, but we kept saying, you're going to put the order on us. You know, so, and no, 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 well, you know, that's where we're going to get bigger storm surges. Uh, actually, in Isaac, back in 2012, we had, two storm surges. So right. that's not typical. You don't see two two of them, but one was when it bounced off the wall and it and it's going to go to the, the least resistance. So that's where we sit. Um, and that's why I think I'm really pushing as of uh, on the heels of crystal ball to see if we can't get some kind of uh, wave break out off shoreline where it won't affect the, the aesthetics of the coast. But that can protect our uh, coast, our coastline over here in Hickok County, from uh, um, you know, elevated waves, the the bashing waves that tear everything up. Yeah, I know that the Corps of Engineers actually um, batted an idea like that around along the entire Mississippi Gulf Coast after Katrina, but uh, it, it never got too far along, I think, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, I, I remember Isaac, I was still in New Orleans, uh, or was in New Orleans when Isaac hit, and I remember the storm surge in particular in per Purlington because, you know, as it relates to that wall, that's where you see the most, of course, you, Waveland's right there next to it, so I understand yeah. this, but Purlington was just decimated by storm surge during Isaac, and there has to be some some um, some truth and some facts that support the reality that that the uh, the storm protection system in New Orleans is in fact hurting coastal Mississippi. And I'll add to that, <laughs> we've got to get a seat at the table on all these important questions. Because when you when you think about the Bonnie Carey Spillway and what's happening there, you know Mississippi seems to be the sacrificial lamb on too many fronts as it relates to that. And but listen, I'm all for protecting New Orleans. New Orleans is really important to our region and all that. That, but we just got to find a more mutually beneficial solution that doesn't put us on the bad end of, of, of many of these decisions. And, you know, and talking about that with the Bonnie Carey spillway being open and, and decimating our coastline with the, with the seafood, you know, all coast mayor, I won't say all of us, but the majority of us went to DC um, to talk about that, uh, the Bonnie Carey. And, and of course, I think it's going to take the same thing, for us to go have a seat at the table, like you're saying, if you if you scream enough, they're going to sit. They're going to listen to you, and that's what we did in that aspect. Um, and so our issue is, as you know, um, Mississippi is, like you said, a sacrificial land between New Orleans Core District and Mobile Core District. Ours is smaller, and so we don't we don't have the authority that the uh, that they have. But the Mississippi River Commission has five scientists on it, um, but none from this area. Uh, so when I looked at last, uh, $91 billion with a B went into that levy system in New Orleans. And they're asking for more money every year to maintain the uh, levy. And look, I love New Orleans. We love it. So this is no down on that. Uh, but we just need to do the same over here, too. In some I agree. Way. I agree. And I think, I think these... These conversations, I think certainly they should have been going on already, and I know they were in a, in a smaller way. But now that the Bonnie Carey Spillway has become part of the conversation, the whole levee protection system and its impact on coastal Mississippi beyond just the freshwater and polluted water and intrusion coming from the Mississippi River, I think all of that will be taken into account. All those solutions, as you know, are so darn expensive, but we've got to start somewhere. We've got to start 
understanding what the situation is so that we can develop a plan and figure out how we're going to get ourselves out of this situation. So, you know, what's been great watching the mayors communicate with each other, because you know, I, I often talk about coast of Mississippi is stronger when we have common issues. And certainly the p pandemic, we have a common enemy in the pandemic. We've been able to learn from each other and get in sync and have these conversations. That part of the pandemic, the communication side has been really good, hasn't it? You know, I um, it's, it's very impressive. Uh, and I, here's what I liked about what I do, is that myself, the other two mayors in the, in the county, um, other two cities mayors in the county, all get along great. So we also get along with all the coastal cities as well. So yeah, early on in this pandemic, it was, um, we were having conference calls, you know, all week long, every day, it was all day conference calls. And so we all made a elected decision and that's what we did. We went with that decision. And I think if you look at Hancock County today and the, the COVID numbers and look back over the past, we've been relatively low over here. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank God. Thank God. For yeah. Uh, so ha let's talk a bit about the beach. Um, so the beach was closed at the beginning of June. It was reopened. Then, of course, Cristobal hit. But when I talked to Trish, she, she said one of the things she said that really hit me, this is a uh, uh, t t excuse me, Tish Williams from the Hancock County Chamber. Tish said, you know, I think we, it, it's easy to take it for granted because you drive by it every single day, but when you don't have access to it anymore, it, it makes you notice it more, makes you appreciate it more. And as soon as you guys opened the beaches back up in Bay St. Louis and in Waveland, you know, people were just everywhere. It was great to see that, wasn't it, Mayor? Then, you know, it gave you, like after Katrina, you felt a sense of doom when Katrina hit. But then you're seeing, you know, people rebuilding. And, and um, so that gave you a sense. Same thing with this. With people back on the beach, it was like, whew, got some freedom back. Uh, <laughs> you know, it took a deep breath. I mean, this honestly, and right now the uh, our beach is closed because of crystal ball. So they're cleaning it up. Um, and it needs to be cleaned up uh, before anybody goes back out there. But, um you know, so that's, people are waiting again, you know, we've taken their beach away and um, not intentionally, but, you know, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you, when is the projected reopening date? It should be very soon. Um, it may be even in next week. Um, it was but, so interesting. I, I live on the water, as I mentioned, in Biloxi and um, on Back Bay. But the amount of seaweed and, uh, you know, uh, Spartina grass and all the, uh, I've never seen so much of it. I mean, I guess the hurricane just hit at a prime time for, you know, the regrowth and the, the Spartina that was there hadn't died yet. But, man, oh, man, I've never seen so much trash. I mean, you know, natural plant light for the most part of it, but still incredible, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was. And that, uh, you know, we've seen that after Gustav um, and Isaac as well, where Gustav was really bad with because it came right across the marsh and all the dead marsh grass washed up. But so many Nutra rats. Now, this time there was there wasn't that many Nutra, but there was a lot of little baby birds mm -hmm. that people were, you know, help, assisting to, to to stay alive. Um, mm -hmm. And but, yeah, the marsh grass was. Even this time, you've seen piles like mountains of it on the beach. Yeah, that's been that's been truly, truly incredible. Uh, but it is a great reminder of how, when you're a you know a shoreline um, city like Waveland is, you know having that beach, having public piers, having uh, hopefully some development at Coleman Avenue, can really bring back that coastal life and that coastal feeling that Waveland deserves. Because good Lord, you guys have fought yourselves out of it one mess after another, and here we are in this moment, and we got a vision and potential pots of money we could draw from. It would be awesome to see all that come to fruition, wouldn't it? You know, I'll tell you, uh, people in Wayland very well. Uh, hurricanes back in, you know, from from um, turn of the century, and then the 47 hurricane decimated Wayland, 69 hurricane decimated Wayland, and again in Katrina. But we're, and so the, the people that were there then are still here now. Um, they love it here. Um, so they're, they're very resilient, but, you know, for Waveland to come back with the vision that we're looking at would be phenomenal for me. I could go home and retire like you and, and, uh, and be happy and smile like you do. So, Mayor, what's, what's the day in the life of, uh, of you look like these days? You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, and, and me, I'm a, I'm a Facebook person, so any information or updates I put on Facebook, uh, 
any complaints I address on play, Facebook. A lot of times that's not the, you know, I don't always say what people want to want to hear, um, but they like that I interact with them directly, one on one. Um, Mayor, I think that's a great strategy. I mean, that, I mean, because you know, let's face it, whether we like it or not, Facebook is king. A lot of people get their information from Facebook, and I know from being in media, and you know from being in public life now that you have to be willing to take your licks. You got to have tough skin, but as long as you're listening to the feedback, people may not always like your answer, but they they will respect the fact that you're engaging with them and you're accessible to them and you're answering their questions and so on. So uh, that's all very good. I'm glad to hear you're doing that. Thank you. Well, Mayor, look, we're, we're coming to the end of our, our time together, but I, I wish you a lot of luck. We'll come back to you in a two or three, four weeks and just see how Please you guys do. are doing. And uh, maybe next time we, we come back, we can uh, we can even dive in a little even deeper about the, the Coleman project and what it really means to your city and the opportunity, maybe even some of the numbers. But we'll dive into all that and uh, do what we can through this show to support you. So thank you for joining us. OK, thank you, my friend. I appreciate being on. OK, very good. This has been uh, Mayor Mike Smith from the city of Waveland. And after this break, we're going to have Jeff Duncan from The Athletic to talk about the NFL season and the Saints. See you after this break. Subscribe for free to the Coast View podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Super Talk. Nobody keeps Mississippi informed like we do. With 12 stations covering all 82 counties. If it happens in your state, we're on top of it. The news, the weather, the sports, and the talk that's important to you. The issues that matter to you, your family, and your bank account. It's all right here. And when you're away from home, depend on the Super Talk app and supertalk.fm to stay in the know. We're proud to serve our fellow Mississippians. Super Talk Mississippi. The Dean's List with Janice Dean. A compassionate young man who became a dinner companion for a stranger makes today's Dean's List. Lisa Mielander and her family had been eating at the Eaton Park in Belle Vernon, Pennsylvania, when she noticed how her server was interacting with a senior patron. The server, Dylan Teetle, had dropped to one knee so he could give his full attention to the gentleman. Lisa wrote on Facebook, the man apologized for not hearing well, and he talked about how he lost his hearing during the war. He was 91 years old with many stories to tell and Dylan patiently listened giving him his full attention. He also helped the man figure out a meal from the menu before putting the order into the kitchen. Lisa tried to flag Dylan down so she could offer to pay for the man's meal. Dylan said someone else had already taken care of the check. Before leaving her table, Lisa snapped pictures of Dylan chatting with the senior and published them to Facebook where they have been since shared thousands of times. Thank you Dylan for your kindness and Lisa for sharing the story with all of us. Janice Dean, Fox News. Thousands of Bulldog fans have subscribed to the Thunder and Lightning podcast. Have you? On each episode, Brian Haydad and Joel Coleman give you an inside look at your Mississippi State Bulldogs. The Thunder and Lightning podcast is free and available on demand at supertalk.fm and on your smartphone. Just search for Thunder and Lightning on iTunes, Google Play, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thunder and Lightning from Super Talk Mississippi. Covering the Bulldogs like no one else. Staying informed is a full-time job, even more so during an election year. That's why Super Talk is here. With Fox News, News Mississippi, and the Super Talkers, you'll go inside the campaigns and we'll separate what's real from what's not to bring you the latest information that matters. From now until you go into the voting booth on November 3rd, your election headquarters is Super Talk Mississippi. Super Talk Mississippi. Available on the Super Talk app and at supertalk.fm. From the Gallo Radio Show Archives. In the house, Mike Hurst. When I started at the end of 2017, sadly, our office had gotten so low during the last administration. I think in FY16, we prosecuted 11 illegal immigration cases. 11, which is is embarrassing. First year I was there, we had jumped almost 700% to 77 prosecutions. And, Paul, that number I think is going to increase very much more this year. We are continuing to see illegal immigration uh, impact crime around the state. I'll give you a perfect example. About a month ago, we prosecuted an illegal alien who had brought 9 kilos of heroin and 1 kilo of fentanyl through our state. Now, to give your listeners an idea of what 2.2 pounds of fentanyl will do, that will wipe out a million people, Paul. That will wipe out a third of our state. This has been another Gallo Radio Show audio archive. 
We serve on the front lines, fighting an invisible enemy and caring for our communities with courage and compassion. The COVID-19 crisis has challenged us like never before. Now, the men and women of America's hospitals and health systems are counting on Congress and the administration to stand with us as we stand ready to care for you in every way, every day. This is House Call for Health. Medical researchers spend years developing drugs to treat cancer, but it's possible the next big cancer-fighting breakthrough could already be in your medicine cabinet. Scientists have long known that a drug for one ailment can sometimes be effective in treating something else. Aspirin is the most famous example. Researchers at Harvard, MIT, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute tested more than 4,500 existing medications. They found 48 drugs that killed at least some cancer cells. These drugs are for several different conditions, including diabetes, inflammation, and alcoholism. One drug is used for treating arthritis in dogs. Researchers in the journal Nature Cancer said the medications sometimes worked in different ways than mainstream cancer drugs. Now they hope these drugs can be further developed into true new weapons against cancer. For more health news, go to foxnewshealth.com. House Call for Health. I'm Lisa Brady, Fox News. What decisions are being made by state lawmakers and how will they affect you, your family and community? If you listen, if you listen, you'll know. Super Talk Mississippi, the Super Talk app and at supertalk.fl. Hi, I'm Billy Kinder, host of Big Billy Kinder Outdoors. Here, the show Saturdays at 1, right here on Super Talk Mississippi. Turkeys, whitetail, Grenada Lake crappie, or Gulfport redfish. We enjoy it all, especially when you're in camp with us on Super Talk Mississippi. Get out of the house and over to Big Play today. Two massive arcades, bowling, go-karts, two mini golf courses, a two-story state-of-the-art laser tag arena, bumper cars, and right now get a $50 game card for only $25. Visit our station's Facebook and print on demand so you can play at Big Play Entertainment Center now. These deals won't last long, so make sure you get your half-off deal. Big Play Entertainment Center, Highway 90 Biloxi. Bowl, play, eat. Go to our station's Facebook to get your half-off deal now. He's the former president and publisher of the Sun Herald, and now he's on the radio. Welcome to Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. Uh, that was a terrific conversation with Mayor Mike Smith from the city of Waveland. It's always good to see local leaders that are so passionate and love their city. Only good things can come as a result of that. So if you missed that, you know, go back and take a look at it at Facebook, Gulf Coast page, uh, Super Talk Gulf Coast page, and uh, you'll be glad you did. Now we're going to turn to chapter here, uh, the page, and uh, turn to my friend, Jeff Duncan, the Saints columnist and reporter for The Athletic. And for those of you who may not have seen my past conversations with Jeff, let me tell you just a little bit more about him. I don't normally do this, but I want to make sure you understand who Jeff is. We worked together at the at NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. Uh, he's been honored four times as columnist of the year by the Louisiana Sports Writers Association. He co he's covered the Saints longer than any other journalist in the nation. Um, he's written two books, Tales of the Saints Sideline and From Bags to Riches, and he's finishing up his third book now, the definitive book about the Sean Payton, Drew Brees era. And I should also point out he's one of 48 members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame Selection Committee, and I'm sure there's more. But uh, with all that, let me just say hello to my friend Jeff. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Ricky. I'm doing good. Thanks for that uh, kind, over-the-top introduction. I appreciate it. Well, you've earned it. You've earned it. You've been you've been swinging for a, a lot of years and doing really well. Hey, incidentally, what's the latest on your on your most recent book? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm actually close to putting this baby to bed. Uh, you know, a book project is a long, arduous task. It's like the black cloud that hangs over your head every day, and it doesn't go away till the book is actually printed. Right now, we're in the revision stage. We've just wrapped it up, so the book should be going off to the printer. I'm thankful that it's actually going to get to the printer and uh, should be scheduled to release uh, October 13th in the fall, so we're really looking forward to it. Well, it's the first of its kind. I mean, I mean, literally the opportunity to make your case that the Sean Payton Drew Brees team is the most significant quarterback head coach 
tandem in the history of the NFL. Yeah, you know, and there's going to be arguments against it. I even have some very respected colleagues that make some pretty strong arguments, mainly because they haven't been as successful in the postseason. Uh, they only have one Super Bowl on their resume. Uh, but we all know Saints fans here, people in the Gulf, uh, Gulf Coast area understand uh, that there's a lot of circumstances involved in that, and you really have to look a little deeper and go beyond uh, just the surface of their record because we all know there was a horrible call that prevented them from making the Super Bowl a few years ago, some fluke plays along the way, and a lot of it really, Ricky, falls down to the, the defensive shortcomings during the breeze, Peyton era, more so than this great offense, which I make the argument is the greatest offense in NFL history, mainly because of the rare combination of this brilliant offensive mind, Sean Payton, paired up with a Hall of Fame quarterback. We really haven't seen that in the history of the NFL. And they've given you they've given you really incredible unparalleled access. And that's been incredible for the book, hasn't it? Yeah, I got really got to kind of peel back the curtain uh, and show readers uh, just how the offense is put together during the week. I think people are going to be fascinated by how much work goes into a, an individual game plan on a weekly basis. And also just how involved Drew Brees is in the game plan, uh, probably more so than any other quarterback in the league. He has a lot of autonomy at the line of scrimmage to really get the Saints into the right play. Uh, he knows the playbook up and down like the back of his hand, and they trust him. Uh, the, co the coaching staff has such great confidence in him to get them in the right play that really he's kind of running the game uh, as it goes on. It's pretty fascinating when you really can kind of get behind closed doors and see how the sausage is made. And I really think, Ricky, that the reason the Saints have been so successful, and, and I know this is not sexy or some kind of secret sauce, it's really just how hard they work. I mean, these two men have an incredible mental capacity and mental stamina to continue to grind away on a game plan and look at film and try and find what they call the golden nugget, the, the flaw in the opposing defense to attack during a given week. All NFL coaches and players put in a lot of work. I think the Saints are exceptional in that area. And Jeff, one other thing before we move on to talk about the NFL season and what to expect going forward. Um, one of the things we talked about on the past shows is the complexity of the of the playbook. I mean, you've got to have a PhD in offense. And when players come into this offense, our young players are coming up right out of college. Some of them get it, some of them don't, but it's not something you learn overnight, is it? No, and it's actually a part of the, the Saints uh, scouting evaluation work, Ricky. They, they actually... Uh, evaluate players on not only their intelligence, but their football IQ, their, uh, their work ethic. Are they going to have the discipline to dive into the playbook every night? Is football important to them? In other words, are they happy just making it to the NFL and making that big paycheck? Are they really into becoming a great football player and knowing your assignments? And if you don't know it in this offense with Sean Payton as head coach, you're not going to stick around long. They're just not going to accept that. And this playbook is as extensive as any in the NFL. I would argue it's probably the most extensive. And that's mainly the result of this head coach, offensive coordinator, offensive staff, and quarterback being together for 15 years. They kept adding and adding to it. And when new players come into the system, they don't dumb it down. You got to catch up. So it's a big challenge. It's so interesting. That's why, you know, athletes, they want athletes, but they want smart athletes and they want athletes with character. <laughs> Those are all things that they're looking for. So, uh, hey, let's let's switch gears real quick. Are we going to have an NFL season? Well, I really believe we will, but there's a lot of unanswered questions right now. I talked to some Saints staffers yesterday that are heavily involved in their training camp, uh, you know, setup. Uh, they organize training camp every year, and they haven't received any guidelines yet from the NFL, or at least only partial guidelines, because I think the NFL is still trying uh, to do their due diligence on this. I know they've got executives over overseas in Europe right now. We, we know the Premier League has started up. That's basically the NFL of Europe. Uh, the Bundesliga, the German Pro Soccer League, has been going now for about a month. The NFL has executives there basically monitoring best practices, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, you know, soccer, Ricky, is very much a contact sport. There's players all over each other all the time. They're sweating on each other. They're spitting on each other, uh, just like uh, American football to some degree. 
So I do think there's promise that we'll have a league. It really, I think, comes down to what everything comes down to, Ricky, money. <laughs> there's a lot of money involved. And the NFL, I cannot see, uh, you know, doing away or, or doing away with a season when so much money is on the line for their sponsors. Now, I don't know if we're going to ever have any fans. I think that's the, the real question. Can we get fans to attend these games? I think that's a big question. But I think there will be some some form of football, yes. It's been so interesting. We literally could we could spend the whole show talking about all the possibilities. You know, if you have all the DBs in a in a in a room together, and you know they all get it simultaneously, what do you do? What if one of your star players gets it? What if the whole team gets it? You know, you know what if they what if this happens during a playoff scenario, whatever that might look like. Gosh, it's so complicated. But and the, and the reality is, the pandemic's not going to go anywhere for this season. It's we're going to the best we can hope for is that some kind of a vaccine comes out after the first of the year, and, and that's still a long shot. So literally, the moment that we're in now is what we're going to be dealing with as we go forward. And you're seeing across America, there's an uptick in the cases, which sort of expected with now that they've begun to open up the economy um there's some tough really t in, in, in incredibly important decisions that are about to be made as it relates to the nfl yeah and i think the nfl because you have a governing body you do have a commissioner a board of directors uh, i think there's more promise uh that they will have some type of guideline and policy in place and a plan i'm more worried about college football to be honest with you because it seems like because there's really no governing body, even though the NCAA technically is, we all know college football is run by the, the presidents and the commissioners of the Power Five leagues. And because every state right now has basically jurisdiction over the policies of you know attendance and uh, potential crowd gathering, uh, you're really going on a state-by-state -state basis. I mean, you're over in Mississippi right now under different guidelines and restrictions than we are here in Louisiana, and it's like that all across the country, and there's no czar of college football, if you will, that can make these decisions on a unilateral basis like Roger G G Goodell can do for the NFL. And from what I understand, the NFL, the way they're going to get around this is it's going to be equal for everyone. In other words, if there's one state that's still holding out that they're not going to have any attendance. Everyone in the league is going to abide by those same uh, guidelines to make it an equal playing field for everyone. There's not going to be 75% attendance in, in Texas and 25% uh, capacity in Louisiana. And I think that's the hurdle that I think college football is facing. There's really no a governing body right now making these decisions. And Jeff, one of the things, we'll come back to this after the break because we're coming to the end of this segment, but what we'll do after the break though, is you're seeing these stories, these fraternity parties, uh, graduation parties in New Orleans. I read on NOLA.com this morning about the series of, uh, of graduation parties where young people were there not practicing social distancing and the, the dynamics around college and the ability to sort of, I don't know, corral the players so that they're not getting you know, infected in some way or another. It's going to be, it, it's, you add to that to what you just said, it really gets complicated. So let's, uh, we'll come back with Jeff Duncan. He's a writer uh, for uh, The Athletic and a Saints expert, and we'll see you after this break. Follow Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1 on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Super Talk MS Coast 103.1. Hey, I'm Steve Azar, and you never know who or what you'll hear when I spend a Mississippi minute with my friends. We are with the fabulous Norbert Putnam as he played on so many hit records, you can't count them, and produced for some of the biggest acts ever. Uh, Norbert, Elvis. And I want to tell you about Presley. He had two different voices. He would sit and talk to me in a very calm, low voice. And we were at Stacks one night, and we were having lunch. We always had lunch at midnight because he was nocturnal. We sat there, and we have our sandwiches, and at 1 o'clock, he looked up. He said, hey, Pot, come on, it's time for me to go be home. And he stood up, and a much deeper voice, he put on his macho voice. Hey, fellas, uh, it's 1 o'clock. <laughs> Let's get cracking, okay? 
In a Mississippi Minute. Be sure to check out In a Mississippi Minute with me, Steve Azar, right here on Super Talk Mississippi, Amazon Alexa, and now on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. We serve on the front lines, fighting an invisible enemy, and caring for our communities with courage and compassion. The COVID-19 crisis has challenged us like never before. Now, the men and women of America's hospitals and health systems are counting on Congress and the administration to stand with us as we stand ready to care for you in every way, every day. Whether you're a rebel, a bulldog, a golden eagle, or just a sports fan, Super Talk Mississippi has got a podcast for you. For you. Sports Talk Mississippi, The Rebel Report, Thunder and Lightning, The Super Talk Eagle Hour, and The Borky Show are all now available for you. And it's all free. Free. Get them all on demand at supertalk.fm and on your smartphone. Just search for Super Talk on iTunes, Google Play, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hey, want to come work for the number one radio group on the coast? Telesouth Media has a great opportunity for an outside sales consultant. Get paid while having fun and work in the exciting, fast-paced world of radio. We have award-winning stations like 97.9 CPR Rocks, 105.9 The Monkey, G96.7, Super Talk 103.1, and 103.5 The Possum. Take the first step towards a new and rewarding career. Submit your resume to jesse at telesouth.com. That's J-E-S-S-E at telesouth.com. Telesouth Media is an equal employment opportunity employer. If a muckety-muck wants you to hear what they got to say, they come here first and sit down with Gallo and JT. This is ground zero for all Mississippi muckety-mucks. Super Talk Mississippi. Watch your favorite Super Talk shows in HD. Just go to supertalktv.com. Ever wonder what goes on in the studio during the shows? Now you can watch what happens in HD. Super Talk TV, streaming now on supertalktv.com. Be sure to go by this station's website and check out the half-off deals. Audubon Zoo tickets for just $15. That's half price. $30 zoo tickets for just $15. Again, go to this station's website or Facebook. Look for the half-off deals logo to purchase yours now. Reminding you why the Mississippi Gulf Coast is such a great place to live, work, and play. This is Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. We have Jeff Duncan, a Saints expert with The Athletic with us today. Jeff, last time you and I talked, we actually went we went, we went position by position and we talked about the recent acquisitions the Saints have made. And I mean, it was really exciting once you got done with the conversation, understanding how much they really shored up so many aspects of their offense and defense, it's going to make them an even better team potentially. Uh, now the question is, can we get these guys in training camp and start to create a real team? What's the thinking about training camp? Well, I don't think we know yet. I mean, I think the, the officials with the Saints are uh, operating as if they're going to start at the end of July as normal on a normal schedule. And I think that might be the only thing that they are acting as if it's going to be normal right now because I don't think we're going to have any fans at camp there's going to be obviously completely different health guidelines for the players. The way they're talking right now, Ricky, there'll be different, basically players and personnel and staff will be tiered. In other words, uh, there'll be priorities based on those people. Players obviously will be in tier one, coaches in tier one, uh, you know, medical staff in tier one. And then there'll be a tier two, and those will be executives that are close to the team. Uh, they're going to be in a second tier. I don't know where journalists will be if they're in any tier at all. Uh, but uh, we're obviously at the Pro Football Writers of America working in conjunction with the NFL to try and find out if media is going to be allowed at some of these uh, workouts. And we're still operating under the under the, the concurrent situation that we don't even know if there will be a training camp. The people at Saints camp right now have to operate and plan as if there's going to be one uh, because you know they haven't heard otherwise. But there's so many unanswered questions right now about this virus. The recent surge, I think, has taken everyone aback. And it seems like every day we have a new news report of an outbreak somewhere, especially in college football, uh, that I think has given everyone pause. So it's going to be an interesting next few weeks, that's for sure. I guess in the meantime, the players have been encouraged to 
work out and run and do the things they need to do. And hopefully they're staying in shape and studying and getting ready for the season. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah. You know, I know Sean Payton is up in Idaho right now, taking a little vacation uh, up on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Uh, he's getting away, recharging his batteries. I think that's something that I've noticed in Sean Payton that differs maybe from past years as he's evolved as a head coach. I think he understands that there's a value to getting away from things. And I think what they've done this year with this offseason, as unprecedented as it is, he basically turned it over to the players themselves and said, look, it's up to you to come back to camp in shape. I think he trusts the leadership on this team and the players that, that they have enough maturity that when they report to camp, assuming they do in late July, that they're not going to be behind the eight ball as far as conditioning. And I think that speaks to his confidence in this roster uh, that they will be businesslike once they get here in late July. And I think it also speaks a little bit to Sean Payton's maturity as a head coach that he's not just grinding away all off season, that that could actually be counterproductive, that there's a, you know, that there's a law of diminishing returns there and how much you mental energy you expend on a team. Uh, and so I think it's probably smart for him to get away as well and come back fresh. So let's talk about Drew Brees for a second. Um, what Drew Brees said, if it had not been in the context of the recent unrest, was perfectly legitimate and whatever. But when he said it, my son and I were sitting there and we said, uh-oh, it, 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 the timing of how he said it and what he said within the context of the situation made him appear to be tone deaf. And obviously he got a, he got a serious education from this. And, and I know that, I mean, in his heart of hearts, he understands why this is different. Now you've written a column that says it's a good beginning. It may not be enough. He needs to do more. Talk about that for a second. We only have a few minutes left incidentally. Yeah. Well, I, I just think if anybody knows Drew Brees, you know that where his heart is and this is the last thing that he wanted to encounter in his career, especially what could be his last season. He's the ultimate team player, and he would not want to do anything in any way that would offend his teammates or disrespect his teammates. They mean as much to him as anybody else in this world except his family. And so I know this was a very disheartening, discouraging incident, and it hit him in the heart. I guarantee you uh, he had some sleepless nights in the wake of this. Uh, Drew Brees is as politically savvy as any player I've ever covered, and I know that uh, it hit him hard when he saw the reaction from his teammates. He immediately was accountable, Ricky, and I knew that's the way he would be. He's an ultimate leader, and that's what leaders do. They own what could be perceived as a mistake. I'm not even sure he made a mistake other than being tone deaf at a time at, you know, in our country, an unprecedented time in our country, and I really believe that He's rectified it. He's spoken individually to the players that he needed to. He apologizes to the team. And we just saw yesterday he was out in Denver throwing pass routes to Emmanuel Sanders, the new receiver. Uh, I, I think really they addressed this the proper way, and it was very healthy in the locker room, and they're going to put this behind them. Well, what – you know, it was hard to watch. And, you know, too many critics saw him as acquiescing, which he wasn't. He was really literally just trying to, well, not trying, he was opening up his heart to acknowledge that the situation in America is different and he should have been more sensitive to it. And he believes that in his core. I mean, I mean, you know that, you know that. I mean, this was not a situation of being politically smart or trying to protect his image. We have 30 seconds left. He really meant it, didn't he? Yes, there's absolutely no doubt. And he will show with his actions, not just his words, uh, how much it means to him. Uh, and he and Brittany both, I think, have already taken steps in that, that direction. And I have no doubt that uh, as a the, the strongest leader I've ever covered, uh, Drew Brees, will rectify this situation. And also, I think the Saints have strong leaders around him, Ricky, Demario Davis, yeah. Yeah. Cam Jordan. They'll get, it, they'll get it taken care of. I'm not worried about it affecting him on the field. Well, this is Jeff Duncan uh, from The Athletic, and uh, we'll have you back soon, Jeff. This is just an ever-changing situation, and we really appreciate you being available to us. Thanks for having me on, Ricky. Always great talking to you. You bet, buddy. Listen live or on demand and watch episodes of Coast View on your laptop, desktop, or on your phone or tablet by going to supertalkmsgolfcoast.com.